Welcome to this instructional video to finish out chapter 11. So let's do some calculations associated with the thermodynamics of membrane transport. Now we've talked previously about kinetics of membrane transport. Remember we had a delta G double dagger, the free energy of activation. Back in Biochem 1 we talked about delta G double dagger for chemical reactions and of course the rate uh, of a chemical reaction is dependent upon the free energy of activation. Same thing for transport. We saw that. We saw the rate of simple diffusion is much, 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 much less than the rate of facilitated diffusion because of, an, of the value of delta G double dagger for transport. But now we're shifting over to the thermodynamics of it, which would be analogous to the free energy change of a, of a chemical reaction, delta G reaction. And in this case, we're going to be talking about the delta G of transport. So this all kind of hinges on well, the first equation uh, requires that, that the solute be uncharged. So, so this will not work for anything that's going to be charged. So the first equation is 11-3. It's a delta G of transport equals RT natural log of C2 over C1. And of course C1 and C2 are concentrations. Uh, R is the gas constant 8.315 joules per mole per Kelvin. And of course the temperature has to be the absolute temperature in Kelvin, and we know that the degree centigrade plus 273 equals the temperature in Kelvin. Just a little trivia here, you don't put the little degree sign for Kelvin because you just don't do that. You can ask Dr. Fannin about that if you like. So here we go. We're transporting uh, glucose in our first problem. At pH 7, glucose will not be charged, so what are the thermodynamics associated with this? Uh, how much energy is it going to take to concentrate glucose inside a cell to a ratio of 120 to 1 at 37 degrees Celsius? Well, all right. I think every time you do one of these problems, you need to draw some type of sketch I think to give you a perspective of what the problem is telling you. So very simply if you have a cell and you have glucose outside the cell and glucose can come inside the cell. Uh, in my mind the way this problem is set up we're, 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 we're concentrating glucose in the cell. So this would have to be C1 and this would be C2. The concentration of glucose inside the cell is C2. Of course this couldn't be done by a glucose transporter. It'd have to be uh, done for example like the sodium glucose symporter that we that we talked about. All right we also know that we need the temperature in Kelvin so this is 310 Kelvin. I think this is pretty straightforward. Uh, delta G of transport sub T equals the gas constant joule per mole times K times the temperature in Kelvin and then we have the natural log of C2 over C1 so this will be the natural log of 120 over 1. Well just like in Chem 111 got to cancel units and so if you kind of punch this in your calculator you should get 12,340.5 joules per mole and that was the units that, that were uh, that were left. Uh, sometimes we like to go into kilojoules so let's just round off 12.3 kilojoules per mole and this answer makes sense. It's a large positive delta G and we know that that should be true because the problem set up a scenario by which we are pretty much pushing glucose against its concentration gradient. So that should be a rather large positive delta G 
value. All right, so these are the kind of calculations we're going to do. Well, let's make this harder because obviously sometimes we have to move things across a membrane that is charged. And so this is a little bit more complicated. So here we go. What is equation 11-4? This is delta G sub T. If it's charged, there's two components to this equation. There's the concentration issue. That's just L uh, RT times the natural log of C2 over C1 that we just got through dealing with. Then we have to have the electrical issue. The electrical component of this equation is fancy Z, fancy F, delta psi. All right, and what does this stuff mean? Well, the fancy Z is just a charge on the ion. The fancy F is Faraday's constant, which I will give you. You don't have to memorize that. And that is 96,500 joule per volt times mole and then this is just the transmembrane potential which typically is 0 0.070 volts or 70 millivolts and of course it's negative inside. Sometimes if I don't tell you what the transmembrane potential is, assume it's 70 millivolts. Sometimes I may give you a problem where the potential has is changed slightly, but that's okay. You can deal with that. Okay, well, let's work a problem. And I've got one written out here. You probably don't have this written down or yet, so I'll, you can stop the video and kind of write this out. So again, you've got to read these you've got to read these questions closely because there's a lot of information given to you. Uh, the concentration of a divalent metal ion is 74 times higher outside a cell than inside. It takes 32 kilojoules per mole of energy to establish this concentration gradient and the transmembrane potential. Let's just say it's 100 millivolts this time. Of course, inside negative. Calculate the temperature. So here we go. Um, we need to set up a perspective. So here is our, let's just say this is our membrane. And this is out. This is in. And of course, we know it's positively charged on the out, negatively charged on the inside. What we're really doing here is we are taking a divalent metal ion, M2+, and we are moving it to outside the cell. And in fact, we are concentrating it outside the cell. Uh, and it's 74 times higher outside the cell than inside the cell. So in my mind, since we're concentrating it outside the cell, then we need to be moving from inside to outside. So this will be C1 out here. This will be C2 here. And this is very important. This, this is something that may not be that intuitive for you. But since we are moving the cation from inside to outside, then that means we have a positive membrane potential to put in our calculation. Okay? And you just got to be careful with this. You've got to decide you know, which direction you're going with this. And so there you go. There's kind of the perspective of what we're doing. So let's now solve this equation. And I'm going to write out the equation and then I'm probably not going to show you every algebraic step to get to the next step. I think you can do that um, in your leisure time, right? 
So let's, we've got this. We've got delta GT. By the way, we've got to calculate the temperature. So we've got to write out the entire equation first. Anyway, that's what I would do. Now, I'm just going to do some algebra. Uh, I don't want to take the time on the video to do this. You should try to work this out. And make sure you, your algebraic skills have been sharpened like a very, very sharp butcher knife. Uh, but if you do all the math, the temperature or the algebra, the temperature is, oh, the temperature is this. All right, good stuff. So, do we have everything we need? I think we do have everything we need. Uh, we've got delta G sub T. We've got the charge on the ion. We've got Faraday's constant. We've got the transmembrane potential. We know what R is. And we've got uh, the ratio of C2 over C1. So if we kind of plug all this in, here we go. Since Faraday's constant is joules per volt times mole, I've put the, uh, the the free energy in joules per mole just so we have like units. That's very important, right? So the charge is plus 2. Faraday's constant. Now here's the deal, the transmembrane potential we need in volts, and we're, as I said in the previous page, it's going to be positive. It's going to be a positive because we're moving something from inside to outside the cell. And then all of this is divided by 8.315, always put the units in here. And if you do all that, the, the, the unit left standing is Kelvin. If you cancel all the units and do everything you need to do, then we should be at 355 Kelvin. So that is the temperature. Guess what? You probably need to practice some more of these types of problems. And so I wouldn't we're obviously I'm not going to give you any more problems until exam number two is over but before we have exam number three where this will be covered on the exam I'll give you some more practice problems to try to help you uh, read different types of problems different scenarios and apply these two important equations so I believe this finishes chapter 11 thank you